Okay. Have you ever embarrassingly fangirled out? Because I have with today's guest. We had technical issues at the beginning of the interview, which is probably great because it helped my nerves calm down. But I am so excited to share this interview with you. I I was really nervous leading up to it, um, but it actually ended up being so great. And I loved the conversation and I'm excited for you guys to hear it. We're talking about how he used to be pro-choice and became pro-life and what made him become pro-life. We're talking about his upbringing. We're talking about working on babies inside the womb and seeing them for what they are, the developing human and being you know, face to face with them. We get ultrasounds, but we don't get to see them like he has. We're talking about, can you be pro-life from a purely scientific angle without having religion in it? We're talking about that and so much more. And I'm so excited to introduce to you guys, without further ado, Dr. Ben Carson. Well, Dr. Carson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So you have said numerous times in numerous other interviews that I have seen that you used to be pro-choice. I'm so curious why you were pro-choice and what, what it was that made you become pro-life. Well, you know, I grew up in Detroit, a very liberal city, moved to Boston, a very liberal city, uh, then went to New Haven, Connecticut, a very liberal city, then Ann Arbor, Michigan, a very liberal city, and then Baltimore, Maryland. So I was liberal uh, and encompassed all the liberal things. Uh, and then I did something you're never supposed to do. I listened to a conservative. <laughs> uh, it was uh, Ronald Reagan, and he sounded just like my mother. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking one day about slavery and how uh, the, the slave owners thought that because they owned the slaves, they could do anything, uh, beat them, rape them, kill them, whatever they want to do. And then I thought about the abolitionists, and I said, what if the abolitionists had said, I don't believe in slavery, but you do what you want to do, uh, where would we be now? So I started thinking it's basically the same situation. Uh, they have thought that maybe the baby belongs to them. It does not have its own life, and therefore you can do anything you want to it. It's the same situation. And what if those of us who don't believe in abortion just sit back and say, well, you do whatever you want. Think about the carnage that results. Yeah, absolutely. So when you were pro-choice, obviously that was some time ago, we're seeing a totally different pro-choice now even claiming that they're pro-abortion. Are you seeing a drastic difference from when you were pro-choice to what we're seeing in the abortion movement now? Yeah, huge difference. Uh, you know, Clinton said, you know, abortion should be safe and rare and uh, legal. Well, now they're saying, it should be available on demand anytime you want it throughout the entire pregnancy. That's a radical change. And uh, it's very scary. I mean, where does it go next from there? Yeah. So we're, we're often told no uterus, no opinion. Well, I'm not told because I have a uterus, but you are probably told no uterus, no opinion. You're a man. Um, you're told that you should just be silent on this issue. What is it that caused you to take this issue to heart and become such a bold voice for the pro-life movement? Well, because, you know, having spent my entire professional career trying to save lives, and uh, recognizing that, that these are lives that don't have a voice. You know, in, in the book of Proverbs, which I start every day reading from the book of Proverbs, and I end every day, in the 24th chapter, it talks about those who are ready to be slain, drawn unto death, and how God is watching us. And do we do anything to stop it? Do we speak up for them? Do we do anything? Or do we just say, I, I, I didn't know. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't know. <laughs> and that's what, and uh, it says that that's not the right thing to do. So I feel we have an obligation to speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. I was talking to the head of the ACLU some years ago. And I was talking about a particular case, a woman who was 33 weeks pregnant, and she 
I was on our way to get an abortion in Kansas, which was the only place they would do it that late because that baby is viable outside of the womb without life support. And, uh, you know, he said he wouldn't answer the question as to whether he would speak up for that baby. And I said, well, you know, I operate on babies that are 25, 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. They're on maximum life support. Will you, will you speak for those babies? Oh, absolutely. I said, but the one who's several weeks further developed and is in the safest place in the universe that they can be, you can't speak for that one. And he said, I realize that doesn't make any sense, but I believe a woman has a right to kill that baby until the second it is born. And I said, would you say that in public? And he said, no, but now they will say it in public. That's how far right. our morality has degenerated. I completely agree. We see people who are um, aggressive. We see people who wear dresses that say, I love abortion all over them. Um, it's gotten to a place where they're unapologetic with their love of abortion. And I feel like society is just c continually degenerating. Um, and I don't think most people, yeah, I don't think most people, if they actually had a chance to see an abortion, uh, would be in favor of it. I mean, in the first trimester, uh, you know, you, you see the tube being introduced into the uterus. A lot of times the baby moving away from it before it rips off an arm or a leg and you see the blood going down the tube. But later on in the second trimester, you know, it's dismemberment. Stick forceps in there, grab something, just pull on it. You don't know what's going to come out. It might be an arm. It might be a leg. It might be mm. part of the innards. I mean, it's unbelievable that you could do that and, and that doctors do it who have taken yeah. the Hippocratic Oath. I just, I don't even understand it. I don't understand how, get, how they can do it. You're right. I, I've said that many times. I said, if you advocate abortion for abortion, or if you advocate against abortion, you should watch one. You mm -hmm. should watch a procedure. Do you should see what you're advocating for or against? Everyone should know what this is because nowadays in comprehensive sex education, they don't tell you what it is. They no. tell you it's a, uh, you know, you're just ending the pregnancy. They don't even tell you that it's a life, but you mentioned working on babies in the womb. And I'm so curious. I'm sure that was such a miraculous thing to see the babies in the womb. Can you you share one of the most memorable surgeries on a baby in the womb? Yeah, an, a, an obstetrician came to me and he said, I have a woman who's pregnant uh, with twins and one of them has severe hydrocephalus and the head is growing so rapidly it threatens to put her into early labor and their lungs are not mature enough. We can't keep them alive so they'll both die. He said, is there something you could do? And uh, there had been an article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks before that that said that intrauterine surgery is a lofty goal. We're just not ready to do it yet. And yet, here was a situation where both babies were going to die. So I was aware of a pediatric neurosurgeon in Philadelphia who was doing some experimental work uh, on intrauterine surgery. And I contacted him and we quickly put something together. Uh, that we thought would work, uh, but we couldn't do it at my hospital at Johns Hopkins. The internal review board said it was unethical. So we went to a community hospital that didn't have an internal review board. <laughs> and uh, we did the procedure and right there on the ultrasound, you could see the head shrink dramatically. And it bought several wow. weeks. Uh, so that their lungs could mature and they were delivered. It was a big national story. It was on the national news. And, and at first there were a lot of critics that said, you know, it was unethical. We were not ready to do something like that. But when it became clear that not only the normal baby, but the hydrocephalic baby were doing great, uh, they all said, well, I would have done that too <laughs> under those circumstances. But, uh, you know, it is really miraculous to see something like that. And, you know, years later, uh, we were at a banquet and this elegant uh, statuesque young woman walks up to my wife and she says, are you Dr. Ben Carson's wife? And she said, yes. And she said, he operated on me and my sister while we were still in our mother's womb many years ago. Wow. And now he's so cool. an adult who is completely capable of taking care of herself. 
And uh, that's why no one will ever convince me that what's inside of a mother's womb is a meaningless bunch of cells. Amen to that. Now, when you worked on them in the womb, did you give them pain medication? Because we're often told by the abortion side that they don't feel any pain. But prior to working on them for whatever surgeries you were doing, did they receive pain medication? Well, the anesthesiologist administered the IV uh, medications to the mother, which, of course, okay. then goes to the, to the children. So the babies do feel pain and you do need to give something to them to prevent them from feeling pain oh, through the mother. They absolutely feel pain. I mean, it's, we know that babies feel pain fairly early on in the gestational uh, timeline. And uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons that you see them moving away from the tube that's trying to dismember them. Yeah. So working on babies in the womb, you've seen them for what they are. You've seen their humanity. I'm so curious, would you say that your faith, because you've touched on your faith here, or would you say that your science uh, and medical background plays a bigger role in you being pro-life? Well, I think they both play a huge role. Um, you know, just my humanity, uh, recognizing what that baby is. I mean, you have a female gamete with 23 chromosomes. You have a, a male gamete with 23 chromosomes. They come together, form a complete individual who's not the mother, who's not the father. Immediately, it starts to proliferate within a matter of six to eight weeks from that gestation. You can already see arms and legs with little toes on them and a face with eye sockets and I mean, a heart is starting to be, are you kidding me? How can you say that that's a meaningless bunch of cells? That's not a real human being. So my yeah. humanity tells me that. But the Bible also tells me that God knew you before you were born. He Amen. knew you in the womb. And uh, I don't think the Bible is telling us a lie about that. The human life, it's so sacred. And if we get to the place where we disregard that life, where we don't respect that life, where do we go next after that? And uh, anybody who's a student of history knows that that's, that's how the whole Holocaust thing started. You know, with, uh, you know, babies that were considered, you know, non-viable or not valuable. And it just keeps expanding and expanding and uh, it really has to do with the lack of respect for human life. And that's what we have to fight against. This is the, this is the front end of that battle. And if we lose it, uh, there are going to be very severe consequences. Very and, 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 I, and the other thing I would just mention, because I think it's important to talk about it whenever you're talking about these issues, is we have a lot of options available for women now who become pregnant, uh, and there is absolutely no reason that you have to kill that baby. There are multiple organizations all over the country who will provide you with help uh, and will provide for that baby. And if you don't want to keep that baby, there are a lot of people who would love to have that baby. Yeah, I agree. So, so you would say from a scientific perspective, say maybe somebody's not religious at all. I am, I am a Christian, a uh, proud Christian, but for those who might not be uh, faith filled, would you say that there is scientific evidence to support life and that people can be pro-life based on science alone? Oh, without question. I mean, you would have to be uh, a total dunce not to recognize that what is in that mother's womb is a living, active a human being that is much more sophisticated, by the way, than the snail darter. And some of the other things that uh, the environmentalists uh, go through great lengths to save, why not save the baby? And the other thing is, you know, if you kill a pregnant woman, you get two counts of murder. So why don't you get a condom motor when you kill a baby by itself? I don't understand that. Yeah. 
No, I agree. I've had three children myself and, you know, I felt them move in the womb. I know what it feels like to be growing life inside of you. I know how miraculous it is. I know that the womb is supposed to be the safest place for babies. Um, I'm so thankful for your work and everything you've done saving lives in general, but also those in the womb. Um, you mentioned meeting somebody who had, you had previously worked on. Have you met anybody else that you had previously worked on? Well, uh, one of the, the, the greatest uh, privileges of my life are running into people uh, that I've had a chance to operate on for various and sundry reasons. And I remember even as uh, Secretary of HUD, uh, I went over to FEMA to speak to the, the volunteers and the workers who had saved so many people uh, after the hurricane season. And afterwards, a couple of them came up to me and said, Hey, Doc. You recognize this guy? <laughs> Everywhere you go, it's it's a great privilege that we have in the medical field to be able to intervene in people's lives and to really make a difference. And uh, that's that's why I find it hard to even understand why people in the medical profession would engage in, in such an activity. Sure, sure. So what do you see? There's, there's a lot going on right now with um, the pro-life movement and abortion supporters, people are, you know, up in arms about many, many things. What do you see as the future of the pro-life movement? Well, you know, the, the breach, uh, the Supreme Court breach was a horrendous thing because the Supreme Court is supposed to be unbiased. And now that introduces an obvious bias and a trust issue. Uh, that is not going away anytime soon. So that, that has major implications. Uh, but I am happy to see that uh, perhaps we are going to move this uh, whole argument to the state level where it belongs, because it needs to be in the hands of the people and their representatives and not in the hands of, of justices who are unaccountable to the people who have lifetime appointments and uh, that's the way our country was designed. That was the intention. And those who rail against that uh, obviously just want things that work for them. They don't really care about liberty and justice for all, which is the way things were designed. Right. Absolutely. Um, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit. Now you're doing American Cornerstone Institute and you have something, I'm a mother. I just mentioned I have three kids. You have something um, called Little Patriots, which I think is so cool. Actually, I have the book right here. I purchased it for my children and I love it. It's called Why America Matters. I feel like I could be an infomercial for you right now. Um, a little Vanna White going on. Um Tell me a little bit about this book and your desire to do Little Patriots, because as a mom, I'm so intrigued. I know we need more stuff like this. Well, it, it's so important that you uh, reach children at a young, impressionable age. Uh, we've known that for a long time. The Bible even talks about it in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go when he's old or not depart from it. But our enemies know it too. Uh, Car it was uh, Vlad Vladimir Lenin who said, Give me your children to teach for four years, and the seed that I plant will never be uprooted. Uh, so they know. So we need to take advantage of that, too, and we need to give them the right information. So uh, America, why America matters is helping the children to realize the, the cornerstone principles that built our country, like faith, which teaches you to love your neighbor, not to cancel your neighbor, uh, and liberty and what that actually means, and community, working together, and life, the importance of reverence for life. And uh, we have a series of books coming out. Another one is being uh, designed right now about why I stand for the flag. What does the flag mean? We don't try to denigrate anybody who kneels for the flag, but we tell you why we stand for the flag and all the sacrifices that went into creating the environment that we have now. And we have one that we're working on now about freedom of speech, but online we have a program that's accessible, Little Patriots Learning, 
Bookshop.com, free of charge, by the way, because we have wonderful underwriters who sponsor it, uh, which gives you, you know, our history, tells you about uh, the start of this country it tells us about those principles that were so important uh, and allowed our country to go from a ragtag bunch of militiamen to the pinnacle of the world in record time. Uh, that was not a coincidence. It was because of those principles and we need to teach them to our children and give them a, a basis on which to be proud and to work hard to maintain that in our country for generations to come. I love that. Well, sign me up to buy the next two books because I will be the first in line to buy them. Um, I'm like constantly looking for something to give to my children uh, where I don't have to worry about what's inside of it and they're being indoctrinated right. or there's something questionable. And you'll notice in there that uh, there's a Liberty Eagle on every page, uh, sort of as the guide. And that, of course, is that's our national symbol, an eagle that has both a right wing and a left wing. And it can't fly with two right wings, and it can't fly with two left wings. And we have to teach our children to learn how to cooperate. And uh, we have to help the American populace in general to understand we're not each other's enemies. George Washington, you're pointing to, who was a man of great faith and prayer. I love it. I love it. Um, so something that I, I usually end with all of our guests and something that I ask because the name of the show is speak out. It is to encourage other people to speak out, listen to people who have uh, used their voice very boldly, who are unapologetic in what they believe their pro-life beliefs and, and even any other beliefs they hold. If you could say one thing to those listening right now and encourage them to speak out on the issues that they're passionate about, what would it be? It would be that freedom is not free. And you have to be willing to speak up for it. And also that we get to choose our future. We get to decide whether we're going to build our future on our past failures or upon our great successes. No one else gets to choose that except we the people. Amazing. Dr. Carson, thank you so much for joining us. It has been such an honor and a privilege to chat with you. I hope to meet you in person someday. Thank you for being here. And thank you for being a patriot.